This is Herb Kressel, and welcome to the December 2015 Radiology Podcast. We have a very full lineup for this month's podcast. First, I'll be speaking with the authors of a Controversies in Radiology pairing that we're featuring on contrast-induced nephropathy. There's been a lot of uh, controversy about whether or not the entity exists and what the risks are. I'll be speaking with Drs. Ulf Nyman and Jonas Bjork from Malmo, uh, Sweden and Lund, Sweden, uh, as well as uh, Dr. Robert McDonald and Matthew Davenport. Dr. McDonald is from the Mayo Clinic and Dr. Maven Matthew Davenport is from the University of Michigan. I think you'll find this discussion quite illuminating. Next, my colleague uh, uh, Dave Kalmas, our deputy editor for neuroradiology, will be speaking with Jody Tanabe on a very provocative study on sex differences in gray matter changes and brain behavior relationships in substance dependent, dependence. I think you'll find uh, this a very stimulating uh, uh, discussion. And finally, uh, Dr. Alex Bankier, our deputy editor for thoracic imaging, will be speaking with Drs. Miranda Kirby and Grace Paraga uh, on their manuscript, Do Imaging Measurements of Emphysema and Airways Disease Explain Symptoms and Exercise Capacity in Mild to Moderate Chronic Obstructive Pulmonary Disease? Uh, this is a a rather long podcast for the end of the year, so take it in small bits. Thank you very much, and have a happy new year. This is Herb Kressel, and welcome to the December Radiology Podcast. Uh, this month, we have a uh, fascinating pair of articles as part of our Controversies uh, in Radiology series. And the controversy that we're discussing is the existence of and the risk of contrast-induced nephropathy. And joining us for the discussion are uh, Drs. Ulf Nyman and Jonas Bjork. Dr. Nyman is Associate Professor of Radiology and Translational Medicine at Skane University Hospital in Sweden. And Dr. Jonas Bjork is a Professor of Epidemiology at Lund University. Welcome, Drs. Nyman and Bjork. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, in the U.S., uh, we have uh, Dr. Matthew Davenport, who is Assistant Professor of Radiology and Urology at the University of Michigan, and Dr. Robert McDonald, who is joining us by phone only. Dr. McDonald is a fellow in the Department of Radiology at the Mayo Clinic in Rochester, Minnesota. Uh, welcome, Drs. Davenport and McDonald. Thank you. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. Yeah, nice to have you uh, with us. And uh, just to sort of set the discussion, uh, our readers may recall uh, several years ago a uh, provocative article uh, authored by Dr. Jeff Newhouse that questioned the existence of contrast-induced nephropathy. And the core observation, as I remember it, that Dr. Newhouse made was that although we have kind of a, an entire literature about contrast-induced nephropathy, most of the studies uh, that drove uh, the uh, concept of this entity were not controlled retrospective studies. And in the absence of a control in inpatients who are sick and tend to have alterations in renal function while they're in the hospital, he questioned whether or not contrast-induced nephropathy uh, exists. And uh, uh, then a couple of years ago, uh, the group at uh, Mayo and at the University of Michigan, Drs. Uh, Davenport uh, and McDonald and your colleagues, uh, reported on very large retrospective propensity match cohorts of inpatients undergoing a CT with and without contrast. And both of these studies, which uh, certainly got a lot of attention in the radiology world, 
show that the risk of contrast-induced nephropathy using the newer uh, low osmolar and isoosmolar agents was lower than previously thought, and perhaps in the case of the Mayo study, uh, non-existent. Uh, and so that's the world as we knew it. And then uh, uh, Drs. Nyman, uh, Aspelin, and colleagues wrote uh, a very thought-provoking uh, essay, which we are publishing this month. And they sort of questioned uh, whether the conclusions based on the two studies may be overstated. And in fact, that contrast-induced nephropathy is a real item, or certainly we haven't excluded it, and it's something that we ought to be concerned about. And they identified a number of key areas, and we'll be discussing them uh, individually. Uh, and the first area of concern was uh, the use of uh, relative versus absolute uh, glomerular filtration weight as a way of stratifying the patient population, and also in general the use of serum creatinine as the measure uh, of damage in these patients. Uh, Dr. Nyman, you want to comment on this? Uh, yes, in, briefly, we, um, the rel relative GFR is generally used in wall cardiology and in radiology papers when estimating GFR when you're doing contrast media examination. And fundamentally, this, this is wrong because what when you when you are evaluating toxicity of drugs that are excreted through the kidneys then the, you should use the individual's gfr these are called absolute gfr and not the one that is adjusted to a certain body surface area now I, now in the counterpoint that uh, uh, dr davenport mcdonald did we are not sure if they really, if they misunderstood a bit of what we were writing. Uh, because, and uh, what, what we want to make clear is that we didn't mean to use any measured absolute GFR. We meant to use estimated GFR. And when you're using MDRD or the Secodepi equation to estimate GFR, then you have to recalculate it into absolute values using body weight and height and a certain body surface equation. And, the re and what we try to explain in the article is that if we have a certain relative GFR interval, for example, with, between 30 and 45, if you take those patients and calculate their absolute GFR. I mean, up to, up to one third of the males will end up in a higher GFR interval. And about 10% of the women will end up in a lower GFR interval. So by using relative GFR, you sort of mix small women with poor renal function with large men with better renal function which may dilute the results, so to say. So, so you're basically saying that the populations may have been somewhat skewed to, with individuals that were actually functioning at a higher level than the way the estimate was done. Uh, yeah. Dr. McDonald, you're sort of from a place with a lot of big, beefy guys. Do you want to respond to that concern? Uh, I'm, so I'm from a place with what sort of guys? <laughs> <laughs> beefy guys. Nice. <laughs> um, well, you know, that's certainly, um, so here at Mayo, we still, although we'll probably eventually adopt an EGFR model, and we certainly calculate a, an estimated EGFR based upon the MDRD equation, and, and, you know, obviously we can use whatever other equations we want. Um, you know, we still sort of derive our, uh, our estimates from uh, serum creatinine measurements in terms of that's how hear how we're sort of risk stratifying our patients for acute kidney injury following CT contrast administration. Um, and, and so our lab uses, uh, uses the NIST standard, the uh, traceable to IDMS, isotope diluted uh, uh, mass spec. And so I'd argue our, our, at least our serum creatinine results, even though we can certainly talk about how serum creatinine isn't the um, best biomarker in the world, at least we're using the most rigorous uh, example where the 
is an inter and intra laboratory uh, variability uh, compared to another lab that uses IDMS is going to be very small. Um, but uh, going back to this idea of absolute, you know, absolute, I think what could happen there certainly um, if we looked at our data and compared to estimated to absolute, it, what, what might happen, um, even though our results didn't suggest there was any, I think it'll just blur the lines where that cutoff between when you look at uh, Dr. Davenport's paper, where that cutoff would be in terms of where there's an increased risk of, uh, of acute kidney injury. So, Dr. Davenport, do you think the difference in your studies might be due to the fact there are thinner people in Michigan? <laughs> um, having lived here for 10 years, I would say that's not possible. <laughs> um, but I think, I mean, I think they make, make a good point. I mean, their point is that there are better ways to accurately evaluate someone's GFR. And I actually have no problem with that. I think they're probably right. If you use an individualized based GFR, which was actually modeled based on the patient's individual weight and individual height, you probably would have a more accurate measure of renal function. They're probably right about that. Good. The reason why the reason why we chose to use GF, GFR in our paper was because that's how risk stratification for this is basically always done. Right. So to be more clinically relevant, that's why we chose that number. Good. Thank you. That, that, I think that's very helpful. And uh, Dr. Nyman, I was also confused about what you meant about absolute. I thought you had to have people in a clinical research center to, uh, to calculate the absolute GFR. So that's very, very helpful. Now, the next thing was this issue of uh, uh, the use of the non-contrast enhanced CT as the comparison group and how there are some maybe a misallocation of confounders as a result of that. Uh, Dr. Bjork, is that something you want to talk about? Uh, yes, I can do that. I mean, I think it's, it's, it's a bit problematic from, from a methodological point of view that although you're using this propensity score stratification, which I think is a very good technique, uh, still you might ask the question whether it, you can sufficiently account for the selection, for the differences between the control group and, and the treatment group. So, so our suggestion was really that, that you could do a propensity score matching within the CM group, looking at different doses and, and uh, match them against each other. Well, that, that, quite different approach. Yeah, I, I think that's a very interesting idea. But just my, my own thought about that is uh, it obviously makes a lot of sense. But if we go back to where we started from, where we had this whole literature on this entity that was based on uncontrolled studies, uh, only of patients who got ill, I mean, it. I just, the, the, the question that, that I would have is sort of where does this kind of high level of concern derive from? The, the core observations were at least as flawed as what we're dealing with now. We have much more uh, refinement. So uh, I don't know if you'd like to sort of respond to that. I think, I mean, it's not, I, from my perspective, it's not either or. I mean, you right. can really do, do both because, because, I mean, there is still this risk for, for a severe selection bias in the results. And one way of looking at that from, from a different angel was, was this suggestion, I, I would say. No, I, I, I think it's kind of, a, in my own mind, sort of this discussion is very, very helpful because it's kind of more the where do we go from here, uh, I think, uh, in doing the best for our patients. Dr. Davenport, do you have any thoughts about sort of the, the comparison group and uh, the problems of using the non-contrast enhanced CT? Yeah, I mean, I actually share his concerns. When we, when we did this analysis, I thought to myself repeatedly throughout the process, is this good enough? Mm -hmm. uh, of course, at the time, this is now 2013, it feels like it's a long time ago, like <laughs> none of the studies... You're a very young man if you think that's a long time ago. <laughs> uh, at the time, you know, none of the studies were controlling for anything, and if they were using controls, they were simple retrospective controls with no adjustment of bias. And so to appropriately select a group uh, that would be a suitable control, this seemed to us to be the best group at the time, and then adjust for all the possible reasons renally that might predict whether someone would or would not get contrast. But when I read uh, your guys' paper suggesting to use dose within a group, that was a great idea, I thought. 
and I think that's a, a great way to take this to the next level. Of course, at our hospital, everyone was getting the same dose, so we would be unable to do that analysis. Um, maybe somebody else would, would have the data available to do it, but at the time, we were not basing our dose uh, based on that. And of course, it would probably need to be in a prospective fashion because those people who are varying their dose oftentimes are doing it on the basis of somebody's weight and height, um, which brings in the other issues we discussed a moment ago. Good. Dr. McDonald, any further thoughts on this issue? Sure. So, no, I, I agree. Um, it is a, it's a great point I, on, on multiple levels. Uh, the first is, you know, is it fair to compare someone in the contrast exposed group who, who had a PE to someone in the contrast in the naive group who didn't get contrast because they have some other far less severe condition, but they have other comorbidities that the propensity score matches those patients up. Fortunately, when we actually drilled down to the data, it doesn't happen that often, but uh, but it does raise a good point. There is still room for some bias in that. Um, now, to sort of touch on the point in terms of uh, varying contrast dose. Our, our uh, practice here does use a, a weight-based nomogram, so our dose does vary a, a bit with weight. Obviously, um, we try to basically shoot for relatively similar concentrations based on body weight in adults. Um, and we actually, although we didn't in our 2013 papers, because I, I think I, I share Dr. Davenport's sort of viewpoint, at that point we looked and we said, well, nobody's done anything yet, so this is a first start. Yeah, um, and, and also I think uh, it was, for us it was a lot of work just to get there, but, but subsequently we have published something that did make it into the journal radiology, but it's in Mayo Clinic proceedings where we did actually control for contrast dose in our models. And so I think, you know, it certainly is a concern, but I think what really our, hopefully I, I'd like to think the initial 2013 papers did is it put sort of some bookends on the, on the problem. And from our, you know, from one end, our, our finding said, look, we, we can't identify contrast-induced nephropathy at all to Davenport uh, and his colleagues finding saying it might exist, but it's really in a subset of patients who have compromised renal function. And I think uh, as the studies continue to come out, we're, we'll be able to refine the window of which, if the, if this entity exists, we'll, we'll, we'll have a narrow window to gauge what patients are at risk. But Dr. McDonald, what was the result? You're leaving us uh, hanging here when you... Uh, oh. Uh, I mean, it's a, we didn't find that that was a, it didn't seem to be an independent risk factor for, mm -hmm. I apologize, uh, for contrast nephropathy. But again, this is a narrow window of doses. It's not like anyone's getting triple or quadruple dose of contrast. All we're basically doing is keeping the intravascular concentration roughly similar between someone who weighs 50 kilograms and someone who weighs 150 kilograms, for example. Good. Now, the, the next item of concern that was raised, uh, and I think this relates uh, to the McDonald study, was the limited attention to the results stratified on non-renal risk factors. Mm -hmm. Yes, I, I could probably comment on that because I think one strength of the propensity score technique is that you can look at the, the subgroups. Uh, and for example, you can, you can look at the group that has received contrast media despite the fact that the, the propensity score is saying that you in a way shouldn't because of the, the, the risk factors that you have at the individual level. And if you do that, if you look at that in, in the, the original um, publication by Mac, McDonald's and, and uh, co-workers, you can actually see that in the medium risk group there is an elevation in this subgroup and it's only a subgroup and it's only observation but I think it's it's still important to look at these data more carefully. Right. Dr. McDonald, you want to comment on that? Um, can we just back up? What were you seeing in our in our medium risk subgroup again? I, I'm sorry, I, I missed that part. Yeah, that was in your your supplementary material for the medium risk subgroup, you had stratum one. So that is the, the group with the lowest propensity score, right? Yeah. And there was, you had a clear elevation there in the, the sin risk. Yeah. 
I see what you're saying. Yeah. Right. So one of the propensity score matching techniques we used was a stratification method, and we actually showed the strata within each. So it's sort of like stratification of the strata. So we stratified our patients into those risk groups based upon our sort of clinical experience of how we sort of mentally triaged patients. Uh, the low risk group were patients with creatinine less than 1.5, who we really didn't think were at great risk, although we didn't know, but those are the people we were least concerned about. The medium risk were between 1.5 and 2 in terms of a baseline serum creatinine and the high risk was above the, it was anything above 2 and so those patients we, we were the most concerned with and frankly for this pa- for that 2013 paper we were very interested in that medium risk group because that that comprises a large percentage of our patients the high risk group patients even though they seem very ominous they're a very low fraction of patients you actually scan every day and so I remember exactly what you're talking about that in the stratification it doesn't clearly march uh, as you normally would expect it. I remember seeing that and being a little bewildered by it as well. As to why that is, I guess for that one thing, I, I guess I was more interested in being uh, intellectually honest and putting our results than, than trying to redo it. But when we subsequently reanalyzed those data again using like a bootstrapping model, and this ended up being in the supplement to the, the paper that looked at uh, of dialysis and mortality. So we did a bootstrapping model where we compared multiple different propensities score matching method and we re- had the computer rerun the propensity score matching a hundred times for each of I believe the five different methods we had very similar results every time and we were able to sort of narrow our confidence interval you know I, I think the results overall still argue that at least from a statistical point of view we can't discern a uh, uh, an effect that you could call contrast-induced nephropathy based upon our data. But no, I, I, I acknowledge exactly what you're talking about, that the stratification was not this clear ramp up from the lowest to the highest risk based upon their propensity score. So uh, I, I, I know that uh, a lot of this discussion will seem very heavily in the weeds to a lot of people who are listening to this, but I must say I think it's important because in the end, we have these very complex, multifactorial uh, situations, and we're trying to make decisions about giving an agent to people that will affect their lives potentially. So uh, it's not trivial, and I think it, it highlights the importance of having good quality data and a good quality analysis, and that uh, I'm pleased to see that both Drs. Davenport and McDonald, the, the, the questions aren't over. Uh, that we're, we're trying to build from there. And I, I think that was really the point from Drs. Nyman and Aspel and Bjork, uh, why you wrote that, that kind of we don't have the final answer. There are issues that remain to be explored. And uh, on the other hand, in the practical world of clinical radiology, people need to make decisions and, and practice. Uh, and I think one of the points of the Davenport and McDonald papers was that you know, perhaps we're withholding contrast for pe- from people who wouldn't have adverse events uh, on the basis of it and who would, you know, benefit from the added information available. So that brings me to sort of knowing what we know now, where are we? And Dr. Davenport, you've been involved, I think, with the ACR uh, mm-hmm. committee that looking at, at, at contrast guidelines, and perhaps you can tell us where we are, uh, what the guidelines are, and what the changes have been. Sure, I'd be happy to. So um, recently, the chapter on contrast-induced acute kidney injury was rewritten. I think there are two major changes. One is definitional, and one is based on the threshold. The definition difference now is that what was previously termed CIN, which is you get contrast, and then 48 to 72 hours later, you have a bump in your serum creatinine. The old definition of CIN is no longer. That's now called post-contrast acute kidney injury. In other words, we're taking away the causative statement implicit within the name. And that's putting out post-contrast acute kidney injury. And CIN is now restricted to only that which can be confirmed to be directly causative from the contrast material, which, of course, is extremely difficult to disentangle on a per-patient basis and requires a randomized controlled trial or um, some kind of advanced uh, retrospective statistics. And the second change is, is uh, based on the threshold. And this, was, this caused a lot of controversy, frankly speaking, in that room as to what number should we put, if anything. There were some people who said we shouldn't even put a threshold down because we don't know yet. And you might imagine who that would have been, who, had, who made those comments. Um, and then there were other people who said, no, we need to guide people so they know what to do. And after a lot of discussion, uh, we decided that the um, level which has the most level of evidence in the literature based on controlled studies 
was a number of less than 30. And we make a bunch of statements about in there, which is the following. One, this pertains to IV media only. And uh, secondly, is that anything involves a risk benefit decision. So it's, it's more complicated than just a simple number. Um, and I can go into a long-winded discussion about why we chose less than 30, but that's what we chose. Good. Uh, Dr. Nyman, how, how do things stand in Europe? Uh, has there been any changes or? Uh, no, there has not, not been any changes. And we had a discussion in, in Sweden at the radiology meeting, and uh, there were people from the European Society of Urogenital Radiology taking part too. And, the general recommendation was to sit on, sit on your hands and wait and, and don't do any changes. And okay. basically the guidelines we have in, in several countries and, and in, in the European societies, there is just one risk group is those below, with GFR below 45. And then you have the other patient group with multiple risk factors and basically with that, independent on what the GFR is. If you have a patient with cardiac decompensation, diabetes, and so on, unstable renal function, unstable hemodynamics, and so on, be careful. And, and um, but so th these are the general guidelines. But then in clinical practice, from my personal point of view, I seldom see any problems because you can solve a problem in a lot of different ways and what I use very frequently in these, these categories is doing ATKDCT and ramping up the MAS. The patients are pretty old generally, you don't have a concern about radiation and you can all, basically half the contrast medium dose anytime you okay, need. So just reduce yeah. the dose if you're concerned. Sorry? The idea is using a lower dose and upping the MAS if you're sort of in that borderline zone. Exactly, so you don't get too much uh, noise in the images, but then you can almost half the contrast medium dose. Okay, and uh, going back to the U.S., uh, uh, Dr. Davenport, uh, what's happened to practice at the University of Michigan? Are you using the current ACR guidelines or uh, are you doing something a little different? Mm -hmm. So we started using something very similar to the ACR guidelines prior to ACR's release of those guidelines. So what we use is if a patient has acute kidney injury or chronic kidney disease with EGFR less than 30, it triggers a provider-to-provider -provider conversation. And that's our guideline. So we have a discussion about what to do. Um, when the EGFR is higher than 30 or higher, then we don't have any specific uh, requirements. And uh, just experientially, uh, have you had these conversations? What's the usual outcome? Um, because our policy tends to be more liberal than what the referring services believe about the nephrotoxic toxic potential of contrast, um, we have these conversations infrequently because there's not many people who are asking for this. And if they're asking for it, they know there's a risk probably too. And so it's, it's on everybody's radar. Um, Good. Uh, I've actually kind of uh, consulted with uh, uh, physicians uh, and sort of had this discussion, and, and we have kind of uh, just on limited numbers, but we have uh, uh, been a little bit more liberal about using it if, it, if it's really an, an indicated situation. Dr. McDonald, where are we at Mayo with this uh, issue? Right. So, you know, our, our um, internal use, we, we still... Like I said, even though we calculate the EGFR, we still are um, using serum creatinine right now, but it's very similar. We have a similar uh, policy to the ACR and to Michigan in that uh, below a creatinine of two, we uh, we feel it's safe to administer contrast based upon the results from our study and Michigan study. We thought that was the most conservative approach, and again, it, it aligns nicely with ACR's guideline because the uh, serum creatinine of two is relatively close to 30. I anticipate at some point we'll transition to EGFR-based measurements and adopt the 30 threshold. So yeah, I think... Um, and in terms of uh, phone calls, well, certainly we still get them because what our thoughts are in the department um, versus what uh, providers are, you know, think uh, is clearly where we certainly get phone calls where people are worried about giving contrast to someone with a serum creatinine of 1.4. Um, and so we certainly try to counsel them. But our policy here is to sort of ultimately the, the decision is, is with the ordering provider. So we'll try to provide, let them know what the best evidence is and, and let them make the best clinical decision from there. 
Well, thank you. I want to thank all the participants today. Uh, I think this has been a very enlightening discussion. Uh, I think people uh, perhaps will uh, have a better sense of the complexity and thought process that goes into kind of thinking about these guidelines. Also, from my perspective, the importance of good quality studies. Uh, you know, we, we kind of throw out, you know, what we need is a prospective randomized controlled trial, but with something like this where the incidence is relatively low, it's very, very challenging to put these together. And quite frankly, in the environment that we're in, I don't know that we're going to be able to see this. Uh, and so we're stuck in a situation where we kind of lurch forward using the best information and processing what we have, and we just have to be aware of the limitations of that. So I want to thank you all for participating. Uh, thanks to our colleagues in Sweden for your contribution uh, in the uh, essay uh, and also uh, in the podcast. And thanks to Dr. Davenport and McDonald uh, once again. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye. Hello and welcome to this video podcast. My name is David Kalmus. I am Deputy Editor for Neuroradiology at the journal Radiology. I'm joined today by Jody Tanaby, who is Professor of Radiology, Chief of Neuroradiology, and Vice Chair of Research at the University of Colorado. Welcome, Dr. Tanaby. Thank you for having me. Sure. We're here to discuss your really exciting paper uh, entitled, Sex Differences in Gray Matter Changes and brain behavior relationships, relationships in substance dependence. Um, and uh, first of all, can you can you just share with us what are the the known sex differences in the natural history of substance dependence? Uh, so there have been several research studies showing several differences at every level of of drug use. So, for example, women have been shown to escalate their use of drugs much more quickly than men. Um, while it's true that men compared to women tend to engage in more risky behavior such as experimenting with drugs, it turns out that women are much more likely than men, for example, to use drugs to reduce depression or alleviate stress. And that is one of the thoughts behind the, the quicker downward spiral for women than men. There are also, also some behavioral differences. For example, with psychostimulants, women report different levels of euphoria, and that is thought to be related to the menstrual phase. Uh, the good news is that women also tend to seek treatment at an earlier time point than men. Mm -hmm. okay. A lot of the sex differences have also been substantiated by animal studies. There have been several animal studies that show that uh, female rodents acquire self-administration paradigms much more quickly than male rodents. Okay, so with that background of the differences um, between men and women with substance dependence, what, what did you do in this study? Uh, so in this study, it was a cross-sectional uh, study where we recruited about 127 individuals roughly divided between healthy controls and abstinent substance dependent individuals and we compared the gray matter volume at a whole brain level and at a regional level between patients and controls and we determined investigated the effects uh, of sex on those on those differences so there have been a number of studies that have shown that gray matter volumes differ between drug users and controls and we also know there is sexual dimorphism just being female or male uh, but there have been very few studies that have looked at the interaction of these two factors. Uh, so we conducted that uh, analysis on T1-weighted structural images, and then we determined whether there were any relationships between the gray matter volume and behavioral measures that may be important in drug dependence, as well as measures of drug severity itself. And so what, what did you find? So our main finding was that there was an interaction between sex and drug dependence diagnosis on gray matter volumes uh, involving multiple areas, primarily frontal 
dorsolateral prefrontal, ventral medial prefrontal, and the limbic system, as well as the tem temporal lobe. Uh, and it turned out that these differences were really driven by the women. So drug-dependent women had much lower gray matter volume than control women, and we did not find these substantial differences in the men. So that, th those were our volumetric findings. And then we took it further and found that there were correlations between certain behavioral metrics. So the one that's most interesting is that there was a negative correlation between the gray matter volume in the nucleus accumbens and drug severity. We measured drug severity by summing the uh, dependence and abuse symptoms across all drugs for each individual. And was that, was that an expected finding or was that surprising? So the finding that the differences would be driven more by the women than the men, that was a, that was a surprising finding. We were, not, we were not expecting to find such vast differences. And what, so what are the uh, potential clinical ramifications of, of these findings? I think one of the uh, I interesting clinical, clinical ramifications is our finding of correlations between the nucleus accumbens gray matter volume and um, drug severity. So all drugs of abuse, for lack of a better term, hijack the dopamine reward system. And that system consists of cell bodies of dopaminergic neurons that lie in the ventral tegmental area with axons pro uh, projecting forward into the nucleus accumbens. So the fact that we found this relationship between drug severity and accumbens gray matter volume suggests that there is a neuroanatomical link between true, true, be true behavior. And does that point to any specific therapy, or is it more just uh, understanding the pathophysiology uh, better? Um, well, it certainly helps us understand the pathophysiology better. It does confirm uh, the current notions about the role of the reward system. Eventually, we hope that this will improve therapies and, and management. I think one way is that because we know that there are differences in the natural history of drug addiction in women compared to men. And if we have some biological evidence of such a difference, it can spur more research into reasons for those differences. Okay. For example, there may be hormonal differences that uh, may contribute to vulnerabilities, and those hormonal differences have varying effects upon different, varying, upon, uh, different regions of the brain. That could direct therapy. It could also help direct management. Okay, and is there anything from the study that the, uh, the practicing neuroradiologist should take away or look for um, in everyday, uh, everyday clinical work? Uh, that's a good question. I think the most important message for the practicing neuroradiologist is that we, we read MRIs all the time. They're, they're the bread and butter. Uh, but I think that this study should make radiologists realize that there may be a wealth of data in that those MRI images which we are not necessarily tapping into. Um, I think that it demonstrates that if you can come up with the right question, then radiologists can make substantial contributions to understanding the biology of disease, not just making a, a diagnosis. Sure. So speaking of, of looking at brain volumes, you mentioned at the beginning of the podcast, this was a cross-sectional study. Um, and does that provide adequate data um, rather than a longitudinal study to understand the changes uh, with, uh, with abstinence and, and differences between the sexes? Well, ideally, you would want to do a longitudinal study and look at how brain volume changes over the dynamic range of short-term versus long-term abstinence. Uh, we, we did not do that, but that is, of course, the ideal study. What we can conclude from this study is that these changes are sustained without the effect of acute drugs. So uh, on average, our patients were off of drugs for about a year, 
Uh, and that's important because, for example, we know that alcohol in the short term can have uh, significant changes in, in brain volume and metabolism at, with acute sobriety over the course of weeks. So I think what this study demonstrates is that there, we can detect sustained changes. Whether it came before or after the drug, I cannot say. Sure. So I, I know that you have a, a current NIH grant to study this. Um, can you share with us um, what you're doing in that grant? Uh, are you looking at other features of the, of the disorder with other imaging techniques? So we're currently funded to look at decision making in drug users. Specifically, we look at risky decision making and uh, we're looking at uh, the striatal system as well as the frontal networks in looking for neural correlates that may underlie bad decisions made by drug users. Uh, interestingly, our R01 was not originally funded to look at sex effects, uh, but this information came out um, afterwards. Okay. Well, yeah, certainly uh, uh, drug addiction is a, is a public health problem, and congratulations on this, uh, this fantastic line of research. Um, is there anything else you want to want to share with uh, with the listeners um, uh, about your project or future projects? I'm just I'm I'm appreciative of the chance to to share this information, and I hope it inspires people uh, in the radiology community to do similar sorts of uh, similar sorts of work. All right. Well, congratulations congratulations on your paper. We greatly appreciate your support of our journal, and we look forward to future great papers from your group. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Hello, my name is Alex Bank here and I'm deputy editor of the journal Radiology in charge of thoracic imaging. Today with us is Dr. Miranda Kerby from the James Hawk Research Center at the University of British Columbia and on the phone, Dr. Grace Paraga from the Imaging Research Laboratories at the Roberts Research Institute. Our podcast today uh, is to discuss a recent article from this group. Uh, the title of this article is the question, do imaging measurements of emphysema and airways disease explain symptoms and exercise capacity in mild to moderate COPD. Dr. Kirby, what is the answer to this question? <laughs> uh, the, the short answer to that question is uh, yes. So we, we, we know that, uh, that exercise uh, capacity limitation and symptoms um, are well described in, in all COPD subjects, including uh, mild COPD subjects. But what's, um, what's not as well known is what are the underlying determinants of the the, the limitation in symptoms in, in these patients. Um, and so what we investigated, uh, a, a relatively large group of, patient, of these patients using hyperpolarized helium uh, magnetic resonance imaging, uh, and we found that it was uh, emphysema that was actually uh, the dominant contributor to uh, both exercise limitation and, and symptoms. I see. Uh, why does helium MRI work so well in early COPD while pulmonary function tests, which are considered the reference standard, if you want, for this disease, do in fact not? Uh, well, I think that the, the hyperpolarized helium MRI um, measurements are, are actually um, giving us uh, functional information uh, on a regional basis. So uh, we're able to visualize all of the places in the lung um, essentially where air are able to access. So if there's parts of the lung that there's uh, obstruction of the, the smaller airways or the medium-sized airways, uh, we don't see the gas going there. Uh, as well, when we have a lot of emphysematous tissue destruction, uh, we're able, and if the gas is able to access those areas, uh, we're also be able to, to measure those uh, enlarged air spaces. Mm -hmm. so we think that these uh, more global pulmonary function measurements, like uh, FEV1, are maybe uh, are not as sensitive at, at measuring the contributions of uh, both the smaller airways and uh, more mild emphysema. Mm -hmm. 
I see. Uh, Dr. Paraga, why is it so important to diagnose COPD early in the course of the disease? Well, I think there are two ways to look at this from our perspective, and I think mainly what we wanted to explain was why in milder disease are there such differences, and why is there so much heterogeneity amongst patients? Patients tend not to be diagnosed until they have symptoms, and they're diagnosed using the standard clinical tools, not imaging, so they're diagnosed using spirometry. Even yet, in the mildest forms, we see a large heterogeneity in symptoms and exercise limitation. And so I think early on, it, I think it would be important for patients to get a full workup so that the underlying contributions to their disease are well understood at the earliest time point so that interventions can be thought through based on that information. I think the second point is that folks who are smokers or, or ex-smokers need to understand that these kinds of tools are out there um, and that the sooner they understand understand what's going on in their lungs, the better. And, and I point to other kinds of tests for heart disease um, and Alzheimer's, where the paradigm for early, early understanding helps with uh, treatment decisions. Mm -hmm. I see. Um, Dr. Kirby, there is a lot of talk about CT-definable phenotypes of COPD. Uh, is helium MRI looking at the same phenotypes? And um, uh, what is the added value that helium MR can bring to the field of imaging and diagnosing COPD? Uh, that's a really great question. Um, so with, with CT, uh, we're able to, to quantify emphysema in all regions of the lung, uh, where with hyperpolarized helium gas, we're only accessing those areas of the lung where, where the gas is access. Um, and we're also able to uh, directly uh, quantify the dimensions of the airways. Where, CT, where with a hyperpolarized gas MRI, we're getting more of a functional uh, measurement of, of where, which airways may be, may be obstructed or narrowed uh, that the gas can access. So we are really getting uh, very complementary information. Um, and I think that uh, our studies and our previous studies have shown that uh, that uh, particularly with our hyperpolarized um, uh, diffusion weighted imaging, we may be able to uh, to identify and measure emphysema more at the earlier earlier stages. Uh, we've we've shown that there's uh, elevated ADC values as well as abnormal uh, diffusion capacity of the lung for carbon monoxide with so DLCO values in, in subjects that have a normal spirometry and normal CT measurements. Uh, so it may be more suited for looking at uh, disease and an early emphysema uh, in these more mild subjects. I see. Um, a question for Dr. Paraga. Uh, given the limitations uh, to the availability of hyperpolarized helium and helium in general, uh, what uh, are the practical clinical implications of using the method you described in uh, COPD patients? Well, there are practical limitations for certain, and this should be taken in, the study should be taken in that context. There is likely very little um, translational potential for helium MRI, but I think what we're doing now is opening up a conversation about using imaging in general in COPD patients. And I also point to the fact that while we uh, have been using helium MRI, and this is a very large longitudinal study that started back in 2009, we've transition to helium xenon MRI, excuse me, and that's the 129 xenon isotope. And that technology is now on the verge of FDA approval and more widespread clinical use. So I think our group and, and most groups worldwide now have transitioned to xenon. And um, there's some interesting um, properties of the xenon gas itself that actually gives us great optimism because there is some more sensitivity. Xenon is more sensitive sensitive to some of these airway and uh, parenchymal abnormalities in COPD and other obstructive lung diseases. I see. So just to make it clear for our listeners, uh, you believe that most or a substantial part at least of the results that were previously obtained with helium can be extrapolated into the xenon framework. Absolutely, and I think uh, we 
we've shown that and other groups have shown that and in particular in COPD and in asthma and um, in fact we're very optimistic about xenon because of its sensitivity to airway obstruction. The gas is thicker and more dense and it is a better approximate or estimate of the constituents of air, the air that we breathe. So we're very optimistic about the potential for xenon to be used clinically, especially in cases where you can't explain why the patient can't exercise, why they're feeling so bad, and FEV1 and other sort of clinical measurements don't explain what's going on with the patient. Interesting. Uh, a question to both of you. Um, in the field of CPD, uh, Imaging with MR um, is always in competition with CT, with pulmonary function tests, so with methods that are either uh, low-cost uh, methods or very widely available uh, methods, while MR is none of, none of the two. Uh, where, if you extrapolate a little bit into the future, where do you see the future role of MR in the workup of COPD? And let's say in five or ten years from now, where do you see the role of MR uh, in the clinical management of patients with COPD? I, can, um, um, I, I, I guess I, I look at it as um, uh, not as MR versus uh, CT versus uh, FEV1. I think it. I look at it as imaging versus uh, these other um, cheaper. Uh, more global measurements that aren't as sensitive. So I think that first, um, I, I really believe in a more multimodality imaging approach because they do uh, provide very complementary information. Um, and I think long term, where I, I see um, imaging being used for more clinical phenotyping, and um, if these uh, these COPD patients can be can be phenotyped early on, uh, then treatment can be targeted uh, towards those uh, those. Those, those, those specific phenotypes, um, and that can, uh, in the long term, uh, improve outcomes. I see Dr. Perrano, yeah. you want to add to that? Yeah, I, I agree with um, Dr. Kirby. Um, I also want to point out that I acknowledge that we're living in a constrained healthcare economic system and that in some cities and some sectors, access to MR and CT may be limited. But again, there is an economic argument for phenotyping patients and having a better look at what's going on with patients because COPD costs a lot of money to the healthcare system, independent of how you're paying for it. And what we've tried to do is shown the utility of imaging to save costs. So, for example, to save costs, if you understand what's going on better, you might obviate the necessity of hospitalization for exacerbation. You might be able to treat earlier and better so that the patient is more functional and feels better. And then they can more readily differentiate when their symptoms are just day-to-day -day problems or they're in fact experiencing an exacerbation and need immediate care. We've looked at the health economic framework for our healthcare system, uh, which is a little bit different than the U.S. And I think that on the whole, if you can make a commitment to scanning specific patient populations as quickly as possible, and MR and CT for a patient can be completed in about 10 minutes, then there's a good argument for using it on the economic and on the patient and the patient treatment uh, basis. Mm -hmm. So maybe <clears throat> if, I, if I understand your message well, you're making a point for potentially investing more in the diagnosis in early stages of disease in order to uh, make uh, economy to spend less in later stages of disease, correct? That's correct. And perhaps there's an argument for even uh, every two years doing follow-up on the patients to watch the pathologies as they progress. I mean, you know, the cost of a scan every two years far outweighed by the cost of all the other types of interventions that happen in these patients. And, and so on, on that basis alone, I think it's justified that we continue to develop these tools. I see. Uh, I think this is a very interesting perspective and a very interesting note and look out into the future uh, to end our conversation. Uh, Dr. Kirby, Dr. Paraga, thank you very much for being with us. Thank you. Thank you.